The cultural scene is buzzing with activity and we were there right in the middle of it all to bring you the best of the best. Welcome to Colours of India, a quick look at the main stories. A prayer to the rain gods. Playful piano tunes. And a treat for the calorie conscious. When faced with intense heat, the thought of rains can be like a mirage in the desert. At an annually organized festival by the ICCR called the Malhar Festival, renowned dancers and singers join together to invoke the blessings of the rain gods. Rag Malhar is a powerful legendary raga in Indian classical music. The sprinkling shah, the fragrance of damp earth and the majestic splendor of nature announces the arrival of monsoons. Classical music lovers call the arrival of the first monsoon shahs with a festival centered on the Malhar, the rain invoking Raka. Vidushi Uma Garg's music presented the unique blend of the best of various gharanas embellished with her own personal touch. After the initial song, Uma went on to sing the song of the monsoons, Gharaj Aye Badara. जैसे जैसे सोशल स्टेटस हमारा चेंज होता जाता है और उन सब चीजों का जो रिफ्लेक्शन है वो हमारी आर्ट पर पड़ती ही है तो जब माहौल सारा चेंज हुआ है तो ये भी शास्त्रीय संगीत भी थोड़ा बहुत तो इसमें चेंजेस आए हैं Legend states that Malhar is so powerful that when sung, rains fall from the sky. Odyssey exponent Shubhada Varatkar, along with her disciples, presented Varsha Vilasam, eloquently choreographing the grandeur of rain from renowned classical Sanskrit writer Kalidasa's poems. said that in life every only thing only thing which is permanent is change <laughs> so and it's very difficult i mean to accept this sometimes we love our art so much so we don't want that change oh this is so beautiful why to change it but then one has to do because the times are changing and now everything is so fast i mean uh, the 
recital duration also. Previously, we used to dance for almost one and a half or two hours. But now, usually, our recital is one hour or, you know. So, we have to fit everything into in within that time frame. So, that's why I think there are certain changes we make in our, our compositions. And um, I think now people have started accepted, accepting this, these changes and uh, that's also beautiful. But of course, we, we are changing, but within the framework. <laughs> Kalidasa's poems depict rain as the one that enters with a royal thumb. Flashes of lightning look like flags. This is the season flooded by lovers. The poem's mood is joyful because the rain causes the crops to grow and the flowers to bloom. And the Malhar festival caught the flavor of this season just right. And rain it indeed did in sunburnt Delhi and that calls for a celebration. More music maybe. He is professionally a lawyer and a politician but he is known internationally as a talented pianist. Mark Damish. When Mark began his first public concert he was just seven. He has kept his talent alive and is now a global phenomenon in the music business. Hailing from the windy city of Chicago, Mark considers Delhi and his city as twin cities, which is why he dedicated the concert to them. my talking about it and also in the program I wanted to try to explain why did you bring this piece for us to hear what was it about the piece that you wanted to share with us so that we could have a shared moment so I think if more performers did that more people would be interested in classical music <laughs> played Jolly Wog's Cakewalk, which is the sixth part of the Children's Corner by Debussy. Jolly Wog, the black man from children's books often depicted as a rag doll, was in fashion during the 19th century and the piece is dedicated to Debussy's daughter Claude Emma and her collection of toys. It is a ragtime piece with banjo-like effects. smooth piano playing to depict the wide open prairies that was very attractive too all in all it was something delightfully different which I in my long years of attending so many concerts I have never come across one like this before and then came Copland's famous Swedes Rodeo and Billy the Kid Mark evoked scenes from the American life and the Old West. He was accompanied by his daughter Alexandra and her percussion added drama to the piece. while his niece Sarah played the triangle. Alexandra also played Chopin's revolutionary etude inspired by the 1831 Poland uprising.
I enjoyed it very much. It had a very homely touch, especially with the two little girls singing so cutely. And the father is excellent on the piano. Wonderful. We enjoyed the evening. The concluding piece was the celebrated dance number El Salon Mexico. And it did not end there. Mark's oratory skills soon had Delhi singing to his tunes to popular US numbers. The answer is blowing in the wind. Beautiful pieces by renowned composers. Mark's music was a celebration by itself. Well, it's time for us to take a small break on Colors of India. Don't go anywhere. We'll be soon back. Coming up next, an interesting conversation, followed by some edible treats. Welcome back. Many a times we meet people in our lives who inspire us and surprise us. My meeting with the director of the Instituto Cervante or the Spanish Cultural Center was one such happening. For this Spaniard from Barcelona, India has been home for over 25 years. His understanding of this land of complexities sometimes runs deeper than that of most Indians. As an Indologist specializing in Sanskrit, Pujol has published a Catalan Sanskrit dictionary. So uh, let's begin at the beginning. You came to India in 1980 at a time when most people in the Western world looked at India as a country of elephants and, and the Taj Mahal and the land of the mystics. And Did any of these images influence the way you saw India or the way you uh, looked at India when you came in here? Well, I came as a, as a simple tourist and of course you, are, you have your head full of images of the exotic India, the incredible India and these image, images have a weight on your perception. But I may say that when, that when I came here, somehow I began to change those, ima those images. I was quite impressed by the, the quality of the human life here. You have the Bhagavad Gita with you every day, you walk around with it, but how has the Bhagavad Gita influenced everyday life for you? Well, you know, I discovered the Bhagavad Gita in a hotel room here in India. You know, it was given as a free book, as they give the Bible, and I started reading it so by chance, you know. And I was, you know, very impressed because of one reason, I tell you. I am a practical man, but at the same time, you know, I have some spiritual need in me, you know. The Gita says, that yoga, real yoga, is yoga karmasu kaushalam, which means yoga is efficiency in actions. So that, I think, is something that we should keep in mind. And at the same time, that beautiful shlok, you know, that is karma nyeva dikaraste mafale shukadachana ma karma falahe turgur mate sangostwa karmani. I think it cannot be higher teaching to that. Do your action, be not attached to the results of your action, be not attached to inaction, because many people are just lazy, they just don't do anything in the name of spirituality, and do your action without feeling any, any attachment to it. Sanskrit, they say, is the base of all Indian languages, but unfortunately we don't use that very often in our everyday living. There's uh, very little of Sanskrit being taught in schools or in colleges. Now, you're the director of the Spanish Institute, Language Institute, and how do you see um, the, the growth of Spanish, Sanskrit? What do you think is, uh, is it that the language lacks? I think Sanskrit has some negative images now in India. No? First is that it's a, a traditional language, it's a null language, it's a backward language. I think that's unfortunate. And I think we should separate this level from Sanskrit and made Sanskrit more appealing to young people, as I said, because it is a secular language. And the second thing, you know, you know, we teach Spanish here to Indian people, and we teach Spanish in, what you say, the communicative way. So we ask our students right from the very first day to speak in Spanish, even in, during the first lesson. And now there is an approach of teaching Sanskrit, which is the same as we teach Spanish here. There is a movement, you know, Sanskrit Bharati, come from Bangalore, and they are trying to do these shibirs, these workshops, 
to teach Sanskrit to, to Indian and people who already know an Indian language. And right from the very first lesson, you know, they will teach you how to speak in Sanskrit. You have started out as a Sanskrit student and then a scholar and now you've come up with a dictionary which, uh, which makes understanding Sanskrit easy for the Spanish people. Mm -hmm. If you can tell us about the work that you've done. Well, you know, it's unfortunate but the, the dictionaries of Sanskrit that we are using are quite outdated. We're working with a dictionary which is from the end of the 19th century called Monier Williams. So I thought it would be good to update dictionaries so I did this Sanskrit Catalan dictionary. Catalan is my mother tongue. It's a, it's a new dictionary, it's an encyclopedic dictionary, so you will find many entries which are more encyclopedic. So if you are looking for, say, who was Arjun, and it has something which is unique, which is a double etymology. One is according to Western grammarians, and that is comparing Sanskrit with Indo-European language, and the other etymology it's the traditional um, Indian etymology from Panini. So both are put side by side. And this is the first dictionary that has both etymologies, one next to the other. Cultural exchanges between India and Spain go a long way, especially the Katak and the Flamenco connection often spoken about. In terms of language, has there been any uh, connection? Can we trace these two languages with each other? There is a colloquial word in Catalan, which we say Calais. Calais means money, right? This is, this is a word that comes from the gypsies. The Spanish gypsies, eventually they come from India, right? Yeah. And you know the etymology of this Calais, which means just money in colloquial speak, and comes because the, the coins were black, Calais, were color. Okay. So there are many examples like this. Even Spanish gypsies will use the word biri for cigarettes, right? And as, as again, through the gypsies and through flamenco, there is a real connection between our countries and a very old one, you know. So before the closing of this interview, would you like to uh, maybe quote another line from the Gita, which has influenced you a lot? I will quote another line, but that's not from the Gita. That will be from, from the Upanishads. It's a kind of Mangala Charan. Om Sahana bhavatu, sahanau bhunaktu, sahaviryam karababahai, tejas vinau aditamastu, ma vidisha mahaihi, om shanti 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 hi. And I just say the last line. We, may we never quarrel between ourselves. <laughs> Pujol can draw many parallels between the Spanish and the Sanskrit world and he is now working on a Sanskrit-Spanish dictionary. Even as director to the institute, Pujol believes in simple living and high thinking and to guide him through life's journey are the teachings from the Bhagavad Gita. Now moving on, Austrian composer Francis Schubert said that guitar is an instrument few people understand. Neil Ranjan Mukherjee definitely does. The chords of the sitar and the guitar come easily to Neil. With Pandit Debu Chaudhary as his guru, Neil is today a known name from the Senia Kharana. And his specialty? lies in the way he fuses the notes of the sitar on a Hawaiian guitar. Unlike the classical six-stringed guitar, the Hawaiian guitar has seven strings and it is placed on the guitarist's lap. Sliding a metal bar along the strings creates the tunes. So the basic thing is the tonal quality of the instrument is still a western tone. Because uh, if you see the Indian instrument, uh, you'll see the crack sound which we call a jawari. So all the instruments have the jawari, but in our instrument we don't have jawari, we have the round sound, which is a very, uh, very uh, similar to the western tonal quality.
Neil began by playing traditional Hindustani music on his guitar. Beginning with an evening raga, he decorated the piece with extensive alap and jod, further infusing different types of tal and jhala. Neil Ranjan is a very young, talented, very good singer. और एक अच्छी बात यह है कि मतलब वो जो एक इंग्लिश इंस्ट्रूमेंट है एक वेस्टर्न इंस्ट्रूमेंट को और एक इंडियन मेलोडी जो इंडियन राग है उस दोनों को कंबाइन कर रहे हैं तो एक बहुत ही डिफिकल्ट एफर्ट है जो सब लोग नहीं करते हैं और इस इंस्ट्रूमेंट के बजाने वाले बहुत कम हैं हवाइन गिटार की एक खासियत है कि इस इंस्ट्रूमेंट में आप समटाइम्स सितार कपूट कभी आपको सरोद कपूट और जो गायकी अंग है वोकल वो भी इन्होंने बड़े अच्छे ढंग से इन्होंने दर्शाया है समटाइम्स कभी सितार का चूँकि इनके गुरु भी सितारिस्ट हैं पंडित देवू चौधरी जी तो इन्होंने तंत्र अंग और गायकी अंग का बहुत अच्छा समावेश इन्होंने इसमें किया है हिस मास्टरी ओवर द इंस्ट्रूमेंट एंड द स्टाइल ऑफ प्लेइंग वॉज ऑल एक्सप्लोर थ्रू द जुगल बंदी बिटवीन उस्ताद अक्रम खान ऑन द तबला Shri Amiya Haldar on the Swara Mandal and Neil on his guitar. It was a new experience and all the more exciting for it. It's now time for us to take another break on Colors of India. We'll be soon back. Coming up, juicy, succulent mango treats. Welcome back. On Food Trail this week, we bring you the king of fruits, on display and what you also get here apart from mangoes are mango products so what are these products and what are these 700 different varieties let's find out more the scene at delhi hut was one of merry making and gaiety huge masses of people thronging the 24th mango festival an ending array of mangoes clipped with unique names Rows of people lining up, all to get one glimpse of the much-loved, much-in-demand mangoes. Mango is known as the king of fruits, and it has more than 1,000 varieties. India produces the largest number of varieties in the world, and we are the largest producer of mangoes in the world. So we wanted to make people aware about the large number of varieties of mangoes and the mango based products. So here in this festival, the mango is the king, the mango is the main attraction. This festival wasn't just about the well-known varieties like the Shera, Chosa or Langra. with names like Neelam and Malika. Colourful, juicy and fat, these pulpy fruits looked every bit delicious. And the names? What names? Nawab brand, Siroli, Doodkarbi, Irvin, Totapari, Simon and Maksus. 
Tariq Mustafa, owner of as many as 400 varieties of mangoes, chose to give me a small treat from his orchard. Well, small it was, but the taste was unforgettable. It's already so sweet. It's kacha, yet it's so sweet. I have given a name to a mango. It's a very special mango, assorted mango. I have given it a name to Sheila. Sheila. Sheila ji. Okay. And I have given name Sheila because of her cooperation to the, towards farmers. And she has done a lot for us. has even discovered unique mango varieties like Gula, a juicy pulp, Fezam, a mouth-wateringly juicy variety named after his grandson, and Husnanara, the sweetest, the Thank fattest you, and the most voluptuous among them all. The festival lived up to its name in the truest sense. A number of manufacturers offered mango-based products too. Pickles, chutney, our popper, juices, and more. The visitors didn't seem to get enough of the unending appetizing variety, despite the heat and the humidity playing through it. 40,000 footfalls per day at the Mango Festival and still counting. Well, did you know that out of 100%, Indians alone consume 98% of mango produce? No wonder they call this fruit the king of all fruits. Well, at least now you know that you can go out and experiment all you want because India produces as many as 1,100 mangoes. For the calorie conscious, this is sweetness that is not sinful. And on that healthy note, it's time for us to say goodbye. I will see you next week on Colors of India. Until then, stay in touch through our Facebook page. Goodbye and take care.